California edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Glad you're still with us. Our guest is Brian Jones. He's a member of the California State Assembly. And I showed you before we started a survey that came out on right. CNBC.com. And they ranked the 50 states on, let's call it business friendliness. There were right. several categories. California's overall score put it 40th right. out of 50. That's troubling to Assemblyman Brian Jones. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's a big problem. There's, there's no reason for California to be ranked anywhere in the bottom nationwide of business friendliness, uh, ability to do business, taxation, uh, regulation, any of that thing, any of those things. We should be number one. California, we are the golden state. We are the golden state. And California historically has been number one up until, you know, somewhere, be, somewhere between the 80s and 90s that started to shift. I, I want to talk to you about um, taxes and I want to talk to you about regulation. Sure. Because I do think that those two issues can get bottled up into one and right. I really want to separate them out. Right. On the issue of taxes, there are various studies and anyone could pluck out any study you right. want, but it seems to be that there's somewhat of a consensus that on taxes, California's taxing kind of is in the middle of the pack, ah. in large part because of um, tax deductions, right. development right. grants. Do you believe that? No, Do you but buy it? Here's, here's the challenge with that. If you take each individual tax that Californians pay, yes, that's true. Each individual tax that we pay is kind of mid-pack. of mid pack. Mm -hmm. But when you add them all together, the cumulative tax rate that we all pay between personal income tax, uh, sales tax, uh, taxes on our vehicles, those all add up to be some of the highest cumulative taxes in the country. Although the, the VLF, decreasing the VLF, some would argue, has really hurt the state, especially local governments. Right. Well, some would argue that, but I, again, I would say it's misappropriation of funds that are coming in. Let's do talk about taxes because I think it's fair to say that Democrats and Republicans would both agree that the way we tax creates wild swings in the state's revenue. Right. We rely too much on income taxes, on capital gains. The governor, the legislature was all excited about the Facebook IPO. Right. The Facebook <laughs> IPO yeah. crashed and now well, we're going to we get... We might be issuing refunds yeah, for that. E exactly, <laughs> for the IPO. So I've spoken with a variety of members, Mike right. Otto, for example, right. one of your colleagues on the Democratic side, and they are looking at what's known as the Parsky Commission, which is looking to flatten out our sure. tax, sure. create a scenario. Maybe we cut income tax, we cut sales tax, but we broaden mm -hmm. the categories right. of, in which we tax right. at services. Sure. What do you think of that? Well, I certainly don't support taxing services. Um, really? Yeah, that, that pushes, that, that has a whole other uh, challenges that it presents. But it pushes a lot of services into the under market or black market, but and even, then you can't track them. Even if we lowered the sales tax overall, right. so you drop it to 5%, but then tax services as well? Sure. The, so then, the, in the next ten or fifteen years, what we what will what will happen then? Left in, uh, unfortunately, the majority current majority party's control is they'll raise all the tax rates again, um, and, uh, well, and and put us right back where we are again. But but let's, for argument's sake, sure. say that for whatever reason, I mean, you can't raise taxes unless you have a two-thirds vote. So right, unless the majority correct. party, Democratic Party, gets two-thirds, right. I'd find that surprising in right. both houses right. and a Democratic true. government. Right. That'd be surprising. But honestly, though, I really want to ask you about that because you're a business person yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, couldn't there be a scenario whereby it would be revenue neutral, um, yet it wouldn't cause those wild fluctuations if you broadened out what sure. you were taxing? No, I, I, I agree with the concept of broadening out the taxation. And, and typically where you would uh, present that and has the greatest opportunity is personal income tax. Mm. You know, right now in California, we have almost 50% of Californians not paying any kind of personal income tax. So now you're, you're basing your revenue on 50% of workers. Well, th that's not sustainable. And, you, and we rely a huge amount on the highest income wage earners. That's exactly right. And that's, Capital gains. And that's why that number of people is decreasing in California over the last 10 years. We've lost that top 1%. That number has decreased significantly. There's fewer number of people in that income category because one of two things are happening. They're either moving out of state or they're just moving their address out of state and staying here and still working. Uh, Mr. Gatto had mentioned that there is a proposal floating around to eliminate income tax in California. Eliminate it. Right. Go the way of Texas, New Hampshire, whatever it is, sure. but then really broaden out that sales tax, almost a value-added tax. Right. 
Well, I'm not, familiar, I'm not familiar with sure. the concept to get rid of personal income tax. Mm -hmm. Again, I would go back to, I would strongly uh, argue against taxing services because you see it in other countries, uh, Canada, other countries have what's called a good and services tax or value added tax. Right. When you tax services, let's say, take your neighbor boy who's mowing your lawn and you pay him 10 bucks a week to come mow your lawn. Well, Are we going to tax well, him on that okay. service? Well, so where do, you, where do you draw the line on I mean, that? Could it be... I mean, because look, we're now more of a service economy. You know, right. we're not going. We're not the local farm, as Mr. Gatto said. We're mm -hmm. not the you know local store. You know, we're doctors and lawyers and accountants. Sure. You know, the local boy mowing your lawn. I don't know. Right. But doctors, lawyers, accountants. Well, there's got to be a place where you draw the line. So doctors, lawyers, and accountants. You've got a, a young accountant just getting right. started out of college, and he's trying to start his practice and get going. And he's got an option at that point in time. He can either do it legitimately and pay the goods and services tax, or you just pay him cash under the table to do your income tax return this one year, and then you know maybe next year he'll do it legitimately, or the year after, or maybe he never does. So how do you, when you tax the income, that's a reportable figure, a reportable amount of money. It's that sales tax. I mean, when you buy a good, arguably reportable. Sure. I mean, there are plenty of cash businesses. Right. Right. I do want to shift gears though and talk about regulation, because I do believe that there is uniform consensus that the regulatory environment in California has something to be desired. Has left, you know, there's something... You know, I wish there was uniform consensus oh, on that, but if you... Even the governor has said we have well, too many damn regulations. Well, sure, even the governor's saying it, but what is he doing about it? Is he proposing any reforms Pension? to... to Pension reform? Well, that's a good one, but that's not regulation. So the the, uh, the, <laughs> the 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 governor Sequa he did for, Sequa reform on Farmers Field, <clears throat> not you so much. Get, you want to? We can dive. I'm from way, LA, you're we from can, San Diego. We can dive way deep into why Farmers Field got a Sequa exemption. Oh, and I the would. NFL. And I, it, it's the NFL. It's the backers of AEG, the company that, that put it forward, and uh, it, it's political connections. Uh, basically, is why Farmers Field got the Sequa Are exemption. We is that how we want our economy to run in California? Well, do we do we want do I we want, want do it. we want CEQA exemptions and regulation reform to be focused only on the people that have the political connections, or should it be a well, fair playing it. field for all people of California? He has said the governor that he would like broader CEQA reform, Absolutely. which is environmental quality. And I would I would support him in that. 100%. But here's what's interesting: whether you support high speed rail or not, and right. I understand you don't, we are moving forward with high speed rail. I for now, for now. Okay, be that as it may. But we may not be moving forward anywhere with high-speed rail because there is no CEQA exemption right. on high-speed rail. Sure. We already know yet. yet. Well, but, but that's the question. Right. You know, whether you like high-speed rail or not, arguably it's a job creator. People are going to have to build it. And do we want high-speed rail to get bottled up in litigation over environment? Is it a job creator or is it a state bankruptor? If, you're, if you don't have private investment coming into well, that, how are you creating jobs outside of the jobs that are already in California? Well, the first leg, we have the money for. But you're moving jobs from, from one part are of the state know? to another part of the state. Are we're we? not creating new jobs. And all we're doing is we're, 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 we're burdening think? our economy. We're burdening our economy but, by taking tax dollars that could go to private investment and private but infrastructure. But that's fighting the battle that w that's been lost. No, I'm still fighting that battle. <laughs> but let's do talk for argument's sake. Okay. I love all these arguments. Except for argument's sake, the money's been appropriated. Right. Wouldn't we rather get the money out there and pass, I'm just putting it out, a CEQA sure. exemption for high-speed rail so any litigation gets pushed through quickly so the people can get to work? Absolutely not. Not? No. No way, because the, I believe that the high-speed rail, as currently proposed, is going to bankrupt the state. So why would I want to fast-track <laughs> that? You know, no pun intended. Right. I want to stop it. And so ha having a CEQA exemption doesn't, that just expedites the, the, the process misery. of, yeah, that ex expedites the misery. <laughs> okay, his name is Brian Jones. He's a member of the California State Assembly. My name is Brad Palmer. As we thank you for watching California Edition. How many states have no sales tax? Four, six, nine, or 11? According to the Sales Tax Institute, Four states do not administer a sales tax. Arkansas, Delaware, Montana, and New Hampshire. 
Welcome to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined today by Don Wagner. He is a member of the California State Assembly. And sir, you know I live in Los Angeles. You live in Orange County. Anaheim is near your home. I really want to be able to take a train from Los Angeles to Anaheim. I can't do that now. Maybe we can in the future as it relates to high-speed rail. What can you tell us about the high-speed rail debate? It really has gotten very convoluted. Well, I can tell you I'm skeptical that you and I are ever going to be alive long Ugh. enough to see high-speed rail. Between... I want to go to Disneyland. I, I'm afraid I don't see it happening. We are, of course, moving forward, moving forward slowly with a section of the supposed high-speed rail through the Central Valley. Um, oh. my, my expectation is it's not coming to, uh, to either the Bay Area or Los Angeles anytime soon. But what's interesting is there is $2 billion as part of that appropriation that some are calling pork. I don't know what you call it, but what I do know is that part of that money is going to the L.A., Orange County metro area and the Bay Area. Brad, that's the irony of the whole situation. There was pork necessary to get the votes right. for the high-speed rail project in the Central Valley. They're spending it in the Bay Area. They're spending it in L.A. County on real infrastructure and real but, transportation. That's good money to spend. But also Anaheim, am I correct? Isn't Anaheim part of that $2 billion? A Anaheim, Anaheim has got a transit station that they've been working on for quite some time. They're pretty close to fruition right. with it, and I do believe some of that money comes to Anaheim as well. Here's what's interesting about the high-speed rail situation. I've lived on the East Coast, and I love the fact that I can go from Washington to Philadelphia to New York to Boston, and I want that for California to go to L.A., to Santa Barbara, to San Luis Obispo, to Fresno, to San Francisco, to Sacramento. But we've been caught up in such a political morass over this. Have we lost the vision? Because, I don't know, maybe I'm Pollyanna, but wouldn't it be nice? There's a lot that would be nice, but the truth is right now we have a very efficient transportation system between Los Angeles or Orange County in the Bay Area. We call it an airplane. We do. And that is, that is much more of a cutting edge technology than the 19th century trains that the governor is talking oh. about. But it's if, expensive. If, if this were the East Coast and maybe we had the culture for it, I can understand it. In the West Coast, in California, what we ought to be, in my view, what we ought to be doing is spending our money fixing our existing infrastructure so that we don't have traffic gridlock throughout South, Orn uh, South well, County, <laughs> Orange County and, and L.A. Let's spend the money where the people are actually but, traveling rather than on, on a pipe dream of a train. But here we are. And the appropriation passed, $8 billion. Um, like you said, a big chunk of that is going to the Central Valley. The last thing that we would want is that becomes an isolated hub, that there's no connection. So, I mean, can we get to a point where it's going, let's get together and make sure this works? I mean, that's my fear, is that there's such anger about the fact that it passed that the parties don't come together. No, my fear is a little different than that. Um, that would be a concern, but the problem is that the price tag of this project has spiraled so far out of control that it's that it's but very it's gone down well, from what it was supposed was going to be a hundred. Now it's sixty-five. Well, billion. no, it was going to be ten, and then it was a hundred, and it's now down to sixty. So you know they're throwing darts at numbers and seeing what the public will buy. In my view, of how this is is unfolding. What, what needs to be done, in my view, is let's spend it the way the public wants it spent. The public does not want at 100 or even at $60 billion a train system. What it wants is what it was promised, and that's at about $10 billion, $11 billion. That's not going to happen. Let's spend that money where it really ought to be spent, improving people's lives, letting them get to and from work a little bit easier, letting them get to and from their daily activities a lot easier. Apparently your view is not the minority. <laughs> your view is in the majority because as you may know, there was a poll that came out in June, LA Times USC, and the question was if there was a revote on high-speed rail, it passed in 2008 with 53%, 33% would vote yes, a 20% drop. What do you do with that information? I mean, the voters have soured on it. Right. It is moving forward regardless. How do we make it work? Well, what I would like to see is, and I sponsor or uh, co-authored a bill to do this, put this back to a vote. Let's see where the public is today. Because that vote that you referenced was based on a much different economic calculation. And it was also taken in a very much different economic time. Let's take a look today what the what the public really wants today, given where we are like, financially. Here's the problem, is that that could have happened prior to the appropriation. It, it still can happen. We, can haven't spent, we haven't spent this money yet. 
we've appropriated it, but we don't yet have the right of way. We don't yet have all the environmental buy-off. There's, there's an awful lot that ne yet needs to happen before the vast, vast majority of that money is spent. Let's not spend the money. Let's go back and see what the public really wants, and let's find a better way to spend it. My gut tells me we probably won't see that revote. That's my gut. So where do we go from here? Well, what you need to do at this point is uh, get the governor in this seat and ask him exactly how he intends to pay for not just the first $10 million that we bonded, but how is he going to pay about, for the rest of it? You know, I used to work in Orange County, and you have some great toll roads that were put in by uh, private ventures, and they work. I mean, they really work well. What about turning to private industry? I'd love to see us go to private industry. I think it ought to be a private project. If developers can come to uh, the state of California and say, we can make this work because it pencils out for us, right. then the state ought to get behind You're it. You're a business guy. That's a, exactly, go. And that's exactly how we ought to be doing all of what we do in state government, is if we can make it pencil out, let's, let's get it done. But if we can't make it pencil out, if the private sector isn't going to get involved, the government ought not be pushing it. The government ought to be stepping back and doing what government is supposed to do, and that's educate, that's keep us safe, uh, that's build roadways so we can move around. Let's not force something that the public now is saying to us it doesn't want. Let's talk about education because you know I have young children. I'm not sure if you have young children, but be that as it may, we won't go there. I used to. I they, used they, to. They, they, they moved on, yes. Um, if you look at large school districts, LAUSD, San Diego uh, school district, the school number of school days has been cut dramatically. In LAUSD, 18 days since 2008. What the governor has said, um, and what nonpartisan analysts have said, is that if Prop 30, his initiative, does not pass, the school year could be cut by 15 days. Mm -hmm. That's troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, or is that scare tactics? Or well, is it both? Well, it is very troubling if that were, in fact, to come to pass. I do believe a lot of what you're hearing is rhetoric and scare tactics. In fact, uh, Dan Walters, a very respected columnist for the Sacramento Bee, has used exactly that phrase with respect to the governor's efforts, scare tactics. If, in fact, his tax proposal does not pass, and in, it, in my view it should not, it's economically the wrong way for the state to go, um, then there's going to be a question, what do the school districts do about it? Right. My, my expectation is that since education is something the state ought to do, that we ought and will start looking at other places to make cuts and redirect that, and let me tell you, and redirect that money to education. And the Republican caucus put out on its website our own budget that explains where we think the cuts can be made and why they can't, they shouldn't be made at education and don't need to be made at education. I, 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 let me give you, you, you yeah. asked where, let me just give you two quick figures. The state of California has roughly 11% of the nation's population. We spend about a third of the nation's well, welfare dollars. Yeah. There are places there to make some cuts. But we made some serious cuts. I mean, we're moving people off of healthy families and well look, we eliminated the healthy families program and that was a program that actually worked here, and delivered more bang for the buck here, than medical issue i believe that there are efficiencies to be found i do believe that i think democrats believe that republicans believe that but we've been running deficits year after year after year we've been cutting and cutting and cutting we've cut a billion dollars from education uc and csu's tuition is soaring where do we go from here? Brad, we have not cut. Let me tell you, the budget, and I sit on the budget committee, the budget, the general fund budget, which is what everyone talks about when they talk about the budget deficit, the general fund budget for the state of California is about $92.5 billion for the fiscal year right. we're in right now. Last year's budget, the general fund budget, $86 billion. We have not well, cut. But five, so, so no, you say we five cut. Years we, ago, we have we were over $100 billion. I mean, We did okay. have Absol ab absolutely. No, the, the, the state, no question, is going through a lean time. But if you go back to the last good year, 2007, the total budget, not just the general fund budget, right. the total budget of the state of California, I believe, is up about $19 billion. We are spending more than we were in 2007. Take a look. Take a look in the parks for some of the money oh, that's we'll been, go, squirreled, we there and I have been squirreled away. His name is Don Wagner. He's a member of the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Palmer. Thanks for watching California Edition. How much water pumped from the Delta flows to agribusiness? Nearly 25, 35, 50, or nearly 60 percent? According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, nearly half of the water exported from the Delta flows to agribusiness.
Welcome back. It's California edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. Our guest Ian Calderon. He is a candidate for the California State Assembly. I want to thank you so much for joining us. And I want to talk to you about campaigning in the 21st century. You know, back in the 80s, 90s, campaigning was very different. We would knock on doors. We would leave flyers. Um, talk to me about how you are campaigning today. Well, a lot of it is still the same. I mean, look, at, at the end of the day, you need to get your message out there. And that message is best um, in mail. You want to get it out mm. through mail. So you want to be able but to have the ability. Well, you want it in mail. The best kind of contact is personal contact, but a more up close and personal, it's a more up close and personal sure. feel. But because of social media and yes. its role, it's more direct, it's and more now. That's what I want to talk to you about because look, I'm doing my best to engage in social media. I just hit 500 followers. I was so proud of myself <laughs> on Twitter, a news guy like me. Um, but look, the younger folks, you know, I have a friend who's on a Disney Channel show and you know, he's a, a kind of a supporting character. He's like 300,000 followers. I mean, the younger folks are really focused on social media and you're a younger guy. So are you using social media as a way to engage uh, your potential voters. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and it's a way for me to communicate instantaneously mm -hmm. to my constituents and those that are following my campaign. And at the end of the day, when you take a look at our government, our government doesn't necessarily communicate to people in a way that, communi that people communicate right. today through these social media outlets. Now, interestingly, you won a pretty bruising Democrat, or well, I guess it's an open primary, but your main opponent was a Democrat. And one could argue more of an old line Democrat, and you're a younger guy. Were you using social media in a way that wound up being part of the winning calculation? Yeah. Facebook was, was big. We, we targeted people that live specifically within the 57th district and did send ads to them through Facebook. Right, that is amazing. You can target ads through Facebook, right. And, and we also did a large focus on our independent voter registration because you, know, you, know, they're, they're, you never know where they're gonna go. Now in our area, they tend to vote Democratic but you never know where the independents are going to go. And your area is essentially, well, it's Whittier centric, Whittier. but it's, it's around the, the Whittier area. Yes. I want to talk to you about Proposition 30. You are not that far off from graduation from university. You went to Cal State Long Beach, a fine institution. Uh, but Cal State Long Beach and many Cal States, for example, have been suffering under the weight of budget cuts. You probably know that the Cal State system has announced that they will not be accepting anyone this fall. They are waitlisting everyone until they find out what's going to happen with Proposition 30. Uh, talk to me about that as a graduate of a fine institution like Cal State Long Beach. When I was attending Cal State Long Beach, that was 2008 when I graduated. Right. Oh, so, yeah. Not, not too long ago. Right. Tuition was $1,500 a semester. Yeah. Now it's closer to four to five, four thousand, six, forty-five hundred, 4,500 yeah. and up. I mean, that's, that's big. That's a big problem. And that with the governor's tax initiative, what that's going to do is that's going to give us the revenues to continue to fund education. And that's, that's funding of our future. That's the next generation. And it, what we have to understand is that that next generation, they're going to determine our revenue stream for years to come. Of course. So if they're not getting an education, that means they're not getting jobs. And that also affects our jobs market because the companies that are here who are already complaining that we have you know, issues with our tax but code. But let's talk about this Proposition 30 tax because uh, it essentially increases sales tax by a quarter cent for four years, taxes on the wealthy for seven years. And I think about your community, for example, there's some well-heeled areas, but some more uh, economically challenged areas. And look, I mean, a sales tax is regressive. It impacts everyone. I mean, California may be a blue state socially, as I've said in the past, but you know, fiscally there's some nerves. So we couldn't even pass a cigarette tax in June. No, you're right. I mean, people right now, they don't want to vote for a tax on themselves, but it's about the messaging. And is the governor going to be able to get the message out to explain, look, it, you have a choice. If you don't pay for the tax, uh, if you don't pay, if you don't vote for the initiative, this is what you lose. If you do vote for the initiative, this is what you maintain. This is what you keep. It's interesting you say that. Your words are precise because as I understand it, if Prop 30 passes, what it will do is it will freeze uh, uh, tuition. It's not going to decrease it because the budget deficit is still tight, but we do know that if it fails, and I'm just commenting on the facts, I'm not endorsing one or the other, I'm just a neutral journalist, if it fails, the governor has said that we will um, lose three weeks of school K-12. Uh, we know that tuitions will spike um, come 2013, 2014. 
Uh, is that enough, though, in your mind, to convince voters that are still suffering under the weight of economic downturn to vote yes? I think so. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, life is about choices. And this is the right choice to make. And, you know, as long as the messaging is right and the facts are out there for people to understand, me personally, it's tough for me. Well, of course. It's, it's extremely tough for everybody right now. But I would vote for this because of how important it is. What about Prop 38, which is Molly Munger's initiative? Her initiative would uh, tax everyone. Uh, the lower income would be taxed less than the higher income point. I think it's 0.4% to 0.22%. Um, a huge chunk of that. I think exclusively it goes to education. I mean, couldn't that be argued as a better uh, proposal? You look, it, you know, I, I applaud her determination to want to do something good for education. I think, in a, as I said before, I think her heart's in the right place. Mm -hmm. It's just that I really wish that before, you know, we got to this point, they had come together and kind of tried to work something out because, you know, like I said before, with two initiatives on the ballot, right, you've said that, there's yes. greater likelihood of them both failing. Now, what's interesting, I don't know if you heard this, I recently read this, LA County is putting an extension of its sales tax increase on the ballot in November as well. That would be for transportation projects. You know, one could argue that may not have been well advised because now you have the governor's initiative, which increases sales tax by a quarter cent, the LA County initiative, which I guess would maintain an increase in the sales tax, a lot of taxes. I mean, these, these, this is not easy. Well, you know, and you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, how things used to be when, you know, Governor Brown was governor he, for the first time. Right. Or, when, or his father. Or his father or, you know, Reagan. I mean, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the tax rates were still higher then than they are today. I understand that's a true statement. I understand that what you say, I mean, if you look at the facts, that is an absolutely true statement. You know, I mean, I understand we're all hurting, uh, but at the, same, at the same time, this is how... The state generates its revenues to pay for roads, to pay for bridges, to pay for all infrastructure projects, to pay for to pay for schools. So, you know, we have to have some line of revenue. I want to look forward, and let's just, for argument's sake, you are victorious in November. Uh, you would enter the capital, I think, December third. It's a pretty quick turnaround, and you will be part of a class that is different than prior classes uh, since the introduction of term limits in the mid 1990s. In your class. Uh, you will be allowed to serve 12 years in a single house if you so choose. It had been six years in the Assembly, eight in the Senate. How does that change your perspective? Well, I remember preterm limits. Yes, uh, I, I do as well. And at the, the, the difference there was that Republicans and Democrats both had to work together mm. because, look, you're going to be working with the same people for 10 12 years. 20 years. <laughs> 20 years. Right. But with, with, with term limits, you didn't have that same type of relationship. So each side would split. We don't have to work right. with you because I'm not going to be here long enough anyways. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I think it's going to do, it's going to bring more consistency to the legislature. And people are going to have, they're going to have to work together because you understand that your colleagues on the other side of the aisle, they're going to be there 12 years, just as long as you are. And that's what we need more of. We need more collaboration. Right. Are you looking towards certain committee assignments? I know the speaker makes those decisions, but you know, are, are you looking to education? Are you looking to judiciary? What, what, what committees are you looking you for? You know, because I'm young, I still feel like I'm so idealistic oh, yes. where every issue is the biggest issue of in course. the world to me. But um, you know, I really want to be the buffer. I, I want to be the voice for that next generation. That's why I ran. So. Anything that focuses on specifically higher education, right. education, but specifically higher education, as well as jobs. I mean, that's mm. what we need. We need to educate our kids and then make sure that we have a job for them to pay off the debt that, we, uh, right. that they incurred um, by going to college. Finally, are you having fun in this election? I mean, it's not easy to run for office. I'm having a great time. Mm. I really enjoy it. I mean, I've been, a, I've been able to experience public service my entire life, and I understand the value there. And you've worked for members. You have family members who are members. Yeah, and I, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of good can come up. And I, and I am honored to have an opportunity to represent my community in, in Sacramento and really just try to offer that different perspective well, from the next we generation. We wish you the best of luck in November. His name is Ian Calderon. He is a candidate for the California State Assembly. I'm Brad Palmer. We thank you for watching Charter California Edition.